Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Arena at the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Design for Computer Science. In this first lecture, I want to talk about the key concepts that we're going to study in this course. What is an experiment? To talk about experiments, I think it's useful to begin by discussing what is science. And that is the topic of this video. So let's get started. So, what is science? Well, everyone enrolled in this course is part of a program on master degree in computer science, right? So I'd like to ask you, what do you think that this word science means? I would suggest pause the video now and think about it for a bit. Now, here are some answers from students in the past year. Uh, we got science is a method to learn about the world, or science is a method to improve society, or uh, science is how we developed uh, new technologies. So I would enjoy it very much if you could contribute your ideas on Manaba or in the video comments, okay? Anyway, so what is science? Well, of course, this question is actually a very open question, and I would say that all answers from the students are correct to a certain degree. Uh, science is a word that means different things to different people, different groups, different societies, and different times in history. So it's not really surprising that the students have different answers to this question. Uh, of course, if we look at the different answers, we're still going to see some common characteristics. Two main points that often appear in student answers is that it's about how to obtain new knowledge and more specifically, how to obtain a better understanding of the physical world. Also, there is a common point in the answers that science is not just obtaining knowledge, but a specific methodology that you follow to obtain this knowledge. On the other hand, uh, there are also some ideas that are usually not included in the answers that I get from students, but I think that these ideas are very important to understand what we call science. So one of them is here, the role of science as a community. So when I talk science as a community, I'm talking about the exchange of ideas, which is an important part of the scientific process. And this exchange of ideas requires a community, right? So another point that is also not often talked about is how science is a continuous process. It's not something with a beginning and an end, but something that permeates our way to see the world. So that's why we say that some people are scientists, because they are not doing science, they are actually living science, right? And finally, uh, there is also the relationship between science and society. And it's different from just this scientific community, I'm talking about the whole human society. And this is a two-way relationship. Science influences the society and society influences how science is done. So it's a very wide topic and one way we're going to talk about these topics in this video and the next one. But right now I would like to talk about maybe one of my favorite ways to think about science, which is look at someone who I think is a scientist and try to understand what they do. I think that this can give us uh, some really good insights. Also, I think it's very important in our lives to look for people that inspire us, right? It's good from time to time to have heroes. So in this video, I would, talk to talk, I would like to talk a little bit about Marie Curie. So who is Marie Curie? I believe that many of you have maybe heard of her before. She is a scientist that was born in Poland in 1867 and she died in 1934. When that's quite young, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. She was a physicist and a chemist and a pioneer on the study of radioactivity. Okay, So a lot of what we understand about radioactivity comes from the research of Marie Curie. Her achievements are highly celebrated by the Nobel Prize. She was the first woman to win the Nobel. She was the only woman to win the Nobel two times. And she was the only person, man or woman, to win the Nobel Prize in two different disciplines, one in physics, another in chemistry. So 
I want you to remember that in her time, it was very hard to be recognized as a woman for your achievements. So the prizes that Curie received are a real testament of the importance and the relevance of her research. She, I think she's a very, very good example of what we think as like a scientist. So let's talk a little bit about um, her early life. I really like when I'm studying scientists where to know a little bit about who they were as a person, because um, not only learning their research achievements, but also their life as well, uh, gives us some insight on what motivates people uh, to learn and to do research. And I think that's really interesting. So anyway, about Marie Curie. As I mentioned before, she was born in Poland. One interesting thing is that she wanted to enroll at a local university to learn chemistry, but she was not allowed because the local university did not actually accept women. So to solve this problem, she enrolled in what it was called at the time a flying university, which is a kind of a pirate university that was sponsored by private individuals to give access to education for people who would not normally have this access. So first thing, pirate university, flying university is totally cool. And second thing, even two centuries ago, we can see how important it is to have initiatives to extend access to education and science to communities that normally do not have this access. Think about that. Also, to support herself, she had to work as a tutor and as a home teacher. So if you are working as a TA this year, I hope that you can see yourself a little bit like Marie Curie, like a start of a very good, a very bright research career. So let's talk a little bit about her life as a researcher. She moved to Paris to earn a physics degree after her study in the flying university that I talked before. For most of her life as a researcher and as a professor, even after she started to attract attention to her discoveries, she had difficulty finding funding for her work. Her laboratory was basically a shed in the university and she had to gather equipment from many different sources and build a lot of this equipment for herself. It was hard to find the resources to support students and assistants. So I really recommend that you look for a pet podcast or a book about the life of Marie Curie. It's really interesting to hear about the challenges that she faced and how she overcame them. So let's talk on all about Marie Curie's research. In her time, there was a lot of interest in the nature of radioactive materials. People knew that radiation existed, but they wanted to understand why some materials emitted radiation while others didn't, and what were the mechanisms that regulated the amount of radiation that a material emitted. So does it change over time? What conditions influence the radiation of material? What could we use um, radiation for? So one of the earliest significant discoveries by Marie Curie was the quantity was that the quantity of radiation produced by a material depended only on the amount of that material. Okay? So she wanted to know how does the quantity of radiation from the material changes. For example, if I hit an uranium rock with a hammer and adding some force to it, does it emit more radiation? Or if I shine a light on it, or if I heat it up, does it emit more radiation? If we can answer those questions, we would understand better what exactly is radiation. So Marie Curie tried several experiments like this that I said that I mentioned, and she learned that the variable that had the highest relation to the amount of radiation was the quantity of material under study. So to predict the amount of radiation in a sample of uranium, we would measure the amount of uranium. All the factors were not so important. And when I say it like this, it feels a little bit obvious, but it's quite important because it indicates that radiation was an intrinsic property of the material. And today we understand that radiation is the atoms of that material breaking down and emitting energy. So that though these were the first steps towards the, that understanding. Now, one thing that I really like about this story is that Marie Curie developed many techniques to study radioactive material. And, this is an important part, she did not patent those techniques. Instead, she shared them with the scientific community of her time, so that other scientists could also benefit from this knowledge and use these techniques to improve the world understanding of radioactivity. 
So she was one of the earliest pioneers of open data and open methods. And I think this is a really inspiring idea. Another part of Marie Curie's story that I want to highlight is that she studied and pioneered several applications of her research, especially in medicine. One of her research results is that she observed that cancer cells died more quickly to radiation than healthy cells. So this means that you could use radiation to treat cancer because radiation would kill the cancer cells faster than it would kill the healthy cells. She helped develop portable X-ray machines that could be deployed easily. These machines were used in the First World War and they were called the Little Queers. Another application of radiation that she researched was the use of radio needles to sterilize tissues and avoid infections. Well, unfortunately, Marie Curie died very young from problems related to radiation exposure. This was a fate that was shared by many researchers of her time who did not yet know of the long-term effects of radiation in the human body or how to deal with them. One thing that's kind of interesting is that her research notebooks are still available in museums, but if you want to read her research notebooks, you need to wear radiation suits because they are still very radioactive. And that's just amazing to think about. Anyway, what we can learn from this story of Marie Curie. I want you to think about how can it help us think about science and the role of scientists? What does it mean to be a scientist? What does it mean to become a scientist? What are the things that we expect scientists to do? And how can scientists contribute to society? Um, this is something that you can see in other people and you can also expect of yourself in the future. Of course, I encourage you to think of, of not only Marie Curie, but other people that you think as scientists and consider what makes them scientists. How do they develop and talk about their ideas? How do they do the experiments? How do they contribute to society? I hope that sometime in the future, lectures to talk about, I, I'm gonna have, I, ho I hope to have some time to, to have more lectures to talk about this, about other scientists and continue this discussion with you. Anyway, uh, this is the end of the first video about what is science, and I hope you enjoy it. In the next video, I want to continue our discussion about what is science by looking at two historical scientific experiments, as well as a very interesting description of science by the Museum of Paleontology in California. See you there.